Uh, let's get more on what this stimulus, how important this stimulus is for the continued uh, economic growth. Joe Brusuelis is joining us now. He is RSM chief economist, and he's joining us from Austin, Texas. Um, so, Joe, as we just heard from Jess, there's going to be a lot of back and forth. We don't know where they're going to end up. Um, how important is it to keep the stimulus going? And not only that, like when you're looking at these numbers and the 200 versus 600, what's the threshold, do you think? Where does it, what's the minimum that people need to be getting? Well, they're going to they're gonna need to be in that minimum four or $500 range just to remain a stable, stable status quo household. When I, I watch the back and forth, what I think is, okay, I've got a minimum of 25 million people getting assistance vis-a-vis -vis this policy each Thursday. We can look at the much bigger number that includes the pandemic assistance and emergency plans. That's closer to 32 million. You just don't cut people off like that without having a, a real optics problem in terms of the economy. You know, when you look at uh, low income and medium income households, those are the ones who really borne the brunt of the adjustment in terms of loss of income and employment. Spending's only down about 2.9%. It's down 10% amongst the wealthy. Why is that? That's because those policies were really effective in terms of preventing a greater economic catastrophe than the one we already have. Joe, hi, it's Adam. It's good to see you. And I'm glad you brought up spending with the, the different uh, incoming quintiles because you pointed out that at the first three or the lowest quintiles, it was 1.9%. So isn't that the argument right there that would say to the federal government, keep those people spending? Because isn't their spending what props up this economy? That's right. Those are the individuals that tend to have what we call negative savings. They just don't save. They spend everything and then some. And indeed, we've seen that as they've tapped credit. For the life of me, with an election less than 100 days away, why one party would want to cut off fiscal aid to the portion of the population that's really, again, born the brunt of the adjustment. And that's just going to make the economic numbers look not that good. And let's be honest, we have a GDP report that's going to come out five days prior to the election. So this is some of the more puzzling back and forth in Washington I got to tell you I've ever seen. Hey, Joe, you track the uh, middle market. They're, they're, they account for a lot of your clients. So we know the big companies are generally doing OK. That's why the stock market's going up. What is happening, though, among medium sized companies uh, and the ones not necessarily represented in the Dow? Well, based on our most recent middle market business index survey, you have seen a, a two month improvement along with the rest of the economy. But small and medium sized, especially medium sized businesses, they tend to lag by three to six months the improvement in sort of the global multi-active national firms. So they're still in recession. And I think this is really important here, Rick, and thank you for asking the question. The real economy is in recession. Financial markets had a V-shaped recovery. We're seeing a nice strong rebound in auto manufacturing, as you saw in the durable goods today. And of course, housing is going to be the leader because the Fed's sent rates to zero. But if you're not in those isolated sectors or really participating in the financial and tech economy, you're hurting. And that's where our real economy is. And that's why that policy decision that's going to be made over the next three to five weeks is absolutely critical for the condition for the U.S. economy. Joe, I want to talk about the, the difference between the U.S. economy and then the, the European Union uh, economies, because I was reading your blog post and you talk about how the EU is going to come out of this particular recession uh, better positioned than the U.S. Uh, and saying it's kind of the, the flip side of what we would normally see, where the U.S. kind of leads uh, out of these kinds of situations. What do you think that means for long term U.S. growth? Uh, and do you think this will be a continuing trend then? where the U.S. falls behind other large economies? Well, a couple things. First and foremost, and I should have said this at the outset of the, of the, of the spot, no vaccine, no recovery. Absent a vaccine, we're just going to see a sawtooth pattern of openings and reopenings, better growth, slower growth, perhaps a little bit of contraction mixed in. European Union just did a much better job at the earlier stages of managing the pandemic, and they're coming out of this first. Both economies are going to suffer permanent long-term damage that it's going to cause a lot of changes that would have happened, say, in five or 10 years. 
to be pulled forward, especially with respect to the substitution of technology for labor. Now, I don't think the U.S. is going to fall behind long term because we've got a culture of innovation, the way in which we integrate technology in the production of, of uh, goods and the provision of services will catch up. I think the important thing is, is we're going to have quite a bit, a really large output gap for quite a long period of time. I don't expect us to be back to pre-pandemic level, say January 2020, really until the middle of the decade, right? The important thing is, is that we're going to have to collaborate and cooperate with our trade partners to yeah. begin thinking about a global production and distribution of those vaccines once they're available. Absent that, we don't get back to that January 2020 economy that we were all pretty happy with. Um, Joe, from Global, I want to get hyper-local for just a moment. You're there in Austin where there's been a resurgence of protests sort of sparked by what's been happening in Portland. And you actually were witness to a shooting that happened over the weekend. Um, you were telling us about it during the break. I just want you to tell our, our viewers about that because I think it's a really interesting personal experience that speaks to what's going on around the country right now. Well, it's it's been a tough summer in Austin. You know, the tear gas, the rubber bullets, the pandemic. And then on Friday night, we, we, we had something very tragic happen. We were upstairs at a place called Bob's, which is a nice steakhouse where you can sit and enjoy the warm summer air here in Austin. And a spontaneous pro protest broke out, a very large one. And uh, unfortunately, somebody drove a car into the protesters. The protesters were armed, as was the person in the car, and there was a killing. And it happened just yards from where we were sitting. And you know, it's, it's a daunting thing when, you, when, when it happens. Semi-automatic weapons, you, you have no time to even duck or, or seek shelter. And you could hear the, the gunshots cascade through the canyons of concrete and glass, followed by the screams and then the panic on the street. Um, we're, in a, we're in a really difficult place in this country, and it, it's, it's devolved, devolved into some form of madness that I just don't get. And unfortunately, here in Texas, there you can carry guns openly. And what we all feared would happen, happened. And I really hope both sides take a step back here. It's gotten too hot. You know, and in fact, if, if these protests, the, uh, the battles between the, the federal police and the protesters continue and it breaks out around the, the country, where our economy is going to slow, we'll all pay a price for this. Joe Bruce Willis, thank you um, for talking to us about what happened there with you. And, and we'll continue to to talk to you about the broader economy and what's happening there in Austin. Joe Bruce Willis is RSM Chief Economist. Thank you very much. Stay safe, Joe. Thank um, you. We'll see you guys again. On the show.